Who are a few of the worst types of people we need to kick out of society? Let's find out. Starting with... Number 5. She loves rewards. Chance Monjin, a convicted felon on parole, found himself back in handcuffs not once, but twice in 2023, thanks to his knack for attracting police attention with his odd behavior and a penchant for illegal substances and firearms. His first run-in with the law that year happened when police stumbled upon him post-crash on the highway, decked out in a ski mask with cash cartoonishly spilling from his pockets, attempting to salvage items from his SUV. The search turned up a treasure trove for law enforcement, a loaded firearm and a mix of illegal substances. Munjin, who was found carrying $5,500, got a quick trip to the hospital for crash-related checks before being escorted to jail. But wait, there's more. Earlier that year, Monjin had a similar episode. While riding a motorcycle, he collided with a car on the highway, begged onlookers not to call the cops as he ran off, ditching a loaded firearm, cash, and a whole bunch of illegal substances, which must have been a crazy thing to see. And worst of all, he was using a fake Texas driver's license, like the whole time. The chase ended with Manjin in the hospital, then jail, but he was out on a $71,000 bond by the time of his SUV adventure. Let's rewind to 2017 for a moment, where Manjin's criminal resume gets a bit more colorful. He decided a Dodge Challenger from a Nashville airport rental car counter was his for the taking. After a bold counter jump and a hasty getaway over spike strips, Manjin was in the wind. But his girlfriend, Christy Cardwell, apparently felt that not only was the relationship probably over, but that it was also the perfect time to cash in on Manjin's latest escapade. Riding shotgun in the stolen Challenger, she called the police, offering to trade Manjin's location for reward money. She insisted on getting her payday before spilling the beans, telling dispatch about her deep understanding of the law and how she didn't have to give him up. The police felt like she was wrong, though, and soon, Cardwell found herself booked for trying to aid and abet her fugitive boyfriend. At the time of this video, Manjin is still awaiting sentencing for the SUV thing. This is a good time to remind everyone, if you're attempting to evade the police for whatever reason, and your girlfriend is in the car, do not piss her off. It won't end well. Just imagine what his face must have looked like when he heard her on the phone with sirens blaring behind them. Talking about ratting him out for a reward though. Number 4. A Heartless Plot 96-year-old Violet Alberts, a beloved figure in Montecito, California, near Santa Barbara, became the centerpiece of a dark and tragic plot. Just days before her 97th birthday, as she laid out ingredients to bake cookies, Violet's life was ended. And why? A cold-hearted impatience for her natural passing, all for a grab at her considerable assets. Pauline Macarino, 48, played the role of the mastermind in this twisted story. She spun a web of deceit around Violet manipulating her trust through a misleading reverse mortgage deal back in 2020. This scheme was just the tip of the iceberg, with Macarena's ultimate intention to gain control of Violet's $6 million home nestled in a neighborhood that boasts celebrities such as Oprah, Ellen, and the Sussexes, Prince Harry, and what's-her-name, Meghan Marker or something, as residents. Basically, it was in an upscale neighborhood filled with really annoying people. Macarena had grown tired of waiting for Violet to pass so she could inherit the estate. So she roped in three men, Harry Basmagian, Henry Rostomian, and Ricardo Martin Del Campo, to accelerate her plans. This trio took a scouting trip to Violet's home, laying the groundwork for their heinous act. The plot ended with Violet's tragic passing by asphyxiation. The getaway vehicle, a Porsche Cayenne, became a crucial piece of evidence, leading to the unraveling of this sinister plot. Investigators had released photos of the vehicle, believing it to be the getaway car used in the execution of Albert's passing. After meticulous investigation, the law caught up with the perpetrators and arrested them. Rostamian and Martin Del Campo were arrested and are now behind bars. Basmagian had a medical emergency in federal custody and ended up on life support. Macarena now faces a six-year prison sentence, but with her plot exposed, more charges are looming over her. Violet's passing marks a tragic end to a life that was rich with community spirit and resilience, despite the challenges of aging. The dumb thing is, Macarena probably would have got away with it if she hadn't been so impatient and outright evil. Number three, the surveilling FBI agent. Mark Allen Wells, an FBI agent from Tulsa, Oklahoma, found himself in a whirlwind of legal trouble after his 
ex-wife and two other women raised the alarm, leading to a startling discovery at his home. Investigators unearthed the stash of 2,245 photos and videos on his laptop, neatly organized into 55 albums, with a disturbing 75% of the content being of the explicit variety. These albums, curiously labeled with women's names, up to 80 of them, contained subfolders that held everything from text exchanges to explicit images, none of which were obtained with consent. The situation deepened when police, though they didn't find any hidden cameras in their search, stumbled upon a fake smoke detector, leading them to believe that Wells was using some sort of recording device. Adding to the scandal, Wells had allegedly shared these explicit images with at least eight individuals, showing the women in compromising positions. The plot thickened as Morgan Balu, Wells's former girlfriend, came forward with claims that not only had Wells bragged to her about his disgusting collection, but after their split, she reached out to Savannah Smith, Wells's fiance, blowing the whistle on his activities. This led to a cascade of complaints against Wells, ending in his arrest and a detailed police investigation. Wells, however, seemed to be in denial when confronted by the authorities, claiming to be unaware of the existence of such a collection. However, his ex-wife added another layer to the story, alleging she had discovered a hidden camera in their guest bedroom. Balu, taking a stand against Wells' violations, sued him for $150,000 in damages, not just for the secret recordings, but also for sharing explicit selfies she had entrusted to him. Both Balu and Smith expressed their feelings of betrayal and disgust, with Smith moving to Southern California to escape the shadow of their shared past with Wells. Facing initial charges that ballooned as the investigation identified more victims, Wells is now up against two felony peeping Tom counts and 11 misdemeanor charges for the non-consensual dissemination of sexual images. The FBI has since distanced itself from Wells, emphasizing a zero-tolerance policy for such conduct and cooperating fully with the ongoing investigation. Number 2. Paging Dr. Fraud Dr. Anthony McGrath, an Irish orthopedic surgeon dubbed Patty Bond for his love of all things 007, orchestrated an insurance scam by reporting a fake burglary, claiming 180,000 pounds worth of antiques that were stolen from his home. McGrath's debt-ridden lifestyle and sophisticated fraudulent mortgage applications to Lloyds Bank, which netted him nearly 974,100 pounds between 2012 and 2015, eventually caught up with him, landing him an eight-year sentence back in 2019. A judge also ordered McGrath to cough up 564,500 pounds or face an additional five years behind bars. Fast forward to 2024 and McGrath refused to repay his stolen money, earning himself five more years tacked onto his sentence. Meanwhile, his estranged wife and Louise McGrath, who was not only unaware of his frauds but was also apparently getting cheated on, continued to live in their two million pound mansion, a property that's also embroiled in the controversy due to McGrath's fraudulent mortgage applications. At the heart of McGrath's crime spree was a desperate attempt to maintain a lifestyle he somehow couldn't afford. You know how surgeons are always just barely making ends meet? Driving a Maserati and dreaming up extensions and renovations for his mansion, McGrath's financial instability and clear spending problem was apparent. His fraudulent activities, including a staged burglary at a rented cottage on the Luton Hoo estate, were part of a harebrained scheme to alleviate his financial woes. McGrath's plan involved an elaborate story of stolen antiques, complete with fake photographs of items supposedly taken, including a marble fireplace and expensive clocks. The catch? Metadata within the photographs revealed they were taken after the supposed burglary and located in McGrath's childhood home in Ireland. Oopsies. Detectives unraveling McGrath's web of lies found inconsistencies in the burglary scene and dug into McGrath's financial history, discovering a trail of massive debt, which was like a big sign pointing at the shady doctor. McGrath's downfall was a testament to his arrogance and misguided belief that his status would somehow shield him from suspicion. As McGrath serves out his 13-year sentence, it's fitting that his need for more ultimately got him less. It's so dumb too, because it's not like orthopedic surgeons are known for just barely scraping by. In this day and age, there's no real reason to ever lose all your money if you have a lot of it. There's plenty of accountants and financial planners out there that will make sure of it. And his wife was a general practitioner as well. Hopefully, McGrath was a better physician than he was a fraudster. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out how these TSA agents were stealing from passengers. Number one, not a supermare. 
Tiffany Henyard, once dubbed the super mayor of Dalton, Illinois, has found herself in a whirlwind of controversy for her extravagant spending habits, which have left the small town drowning in a massive $5 million debt. The failed burger joint owner turned local leader has reportedly been splashing the town's cash on unapproved ice rinks, endless parties, and luxury travels, including first-class flights and stays in high-end hotels like the Four Seasons. Since taking office in 2021, Henyard's flamboyant expenditures have included hiring DJs for government meetings and utilizing local police officers as part of her personal security detail, something she had obviously needed in a small town, costing the town about a million dollars in overtime. This spending spree has become a sore point for Dalton, a community of around 20,000 people just south of Chicago, now buried under a massive financial burden. The tale of Henyard's tenure is filled with head-scratching moments, such as her decision to build an ice rink for $100 $115,000 without the village board's approval, and then proceeding to hire a separate company to complete the project right before an election, using it as a platform to mock the town board. Furthermore, Henyard and the town board controversially voted to donate $10,000 to her own foundation, which allegedly supports cancer patients but was chartered on the very day of the donation. Equally head scratching was her arrest in 2016. She was arrested and officially charged with criminal trespass to vehicle according to Chicago police records. So, she was trying to break into more than one car to commit a crime? Interesting. Anyways, Henyard's love for throwing parties and undertaking costly trips on the town's dime has also become a significant issue. Notably, her travels to cities like Atlanta, Austin, and New York City, when she spared no expense on accommodations and travel comforts, have cost Dalton over $67,000. Moreover, her usage of local cops for personal personal errands and security has added seven figures in overtime pay to the town's expenses. Trustees have taken legal action against Henyard, accusing her of financial misconduct, including forging checks and withholding financial records. In response, Henyard has accused her critics of coming after her because of her race, despite many of them being black themselves. With a combined salary of about $285,000 from her roles as mayor and Thornton Township supervisor, Henyard's leadership has raised questions about her priorities and the fiscal sustainability of Dalton under her watch. Have you ever worked at a place that hired a new manager only to find out that this person is clearly unqualified and unready for the position? These criminals just couldn't wait to steal from innocent people. Let's get right to it, starting with... Number six, a model scam. Fashion model Annie Dutt stole credit card information and ripped off a bunch of chemist warehouses, an Australian discount pharmacy chain. Dutt, whose family fled war-torn South Sudan when he was three, was scouted while hanging out with friends at a hotel in Sydney. By 2016, Dutt was signed with the prestigious Chadwick Models Agency. Dubbed South Sudan's third most handsome man alive, Dutt worked for some of the world's biggest designers, such as as Tommy Hilfiger, Camilla and Mark, and Jack London. Even though he was pretty successful, Dutt apparently felt like he needed a side hustle. Being paid to be good looking just wasn't enough. So he bought stolen credit card information from illegal websites that acted like a marketplace for people wanting to commit fraud. Once Dutt had the card information, he went on shopping sprees at various chemist warehouses locations in Sydney. After buying a bunch of whatever you'd buy at a discount pharmacy, off-brand desktop fans and cheap makeup up probably, Dutt returned to the items and requested that the refunds go to his personal bank account rather than back onto the card. When Chemist Warehouse and Dutt's victims eventually figured out they were being scammed, they contacted law enforcement. Investigators found security camera footage of Dutt making the purchases and arrested him. Police seized Dutt's cell phone where he had a tab open for ccvstore.net, a website that sells credit card information, including the numbers, expiration dates, and CVV numbers. They also uncovered that he shared at least six of the 19 card numbers he'd acquired with a third party. But buying and selling credit cards from the dark web was far from the only crime he committed. In 2013, Dutt was convicted of assault. Then, in 2016, his license was suspended for driving under the influence. He temporarily lost the ability to drive again in 2020 after getting behind the wheel with that suspended license. And around the same time he was scamming Chemist Warehouse, Dutt was also accused of throwing a glass bottle at Janae Capablanca, the mother of their young daughter. Police were 
were sent to Dutt's apartment late at night when two men were fighting in the street. Officers found Dutt with his shirt ripped open, and not in a hot model kind of way, but in a fighty kind of way. And Oliver Diverge, Janea's godfather, who was bleeding profusely from a gash on his forehead. The fight started when Diverge was at dinner with Janea's mom when she got a phone call from her daughter because Dutt had thrown the bottle at her. So the pair rushed into a taxi to go pick up Janea and the baby, but were greeted by Dutt once they arrived. Dutt was acting belligerent, shoved Janae's mom out of the way, and began to pummel Diverge, leaving a scar on his forehead. Dutt claimed to not have started the fight, but has since pleaded guilty to the charge. For his credit card fraud, Dutt was remorseful in court and told reporters that he already paid back the money he stole and apologized to his victims. He was charged with multiple counts of dealing with identity information to commit an indictable offense. Sounds like he wasn't exactly a model citizen. Number five, she'll be back soon. Donald Felix Zampak posed as his deceased mother for over 30 years after she passed, so he could receive her social security payments and veteran benefits. Zampak's mother had passed away in 1990 in Japan, but rather than report her passing, he decided to assume his mother's identity. He forged her signature on benefit eligibility certificates, filed fraudulent federal income tax returns, and even maintained her bank accounts. Zampak also racked up credit card debts in her name. Zampak received roughly $830,000 of his mother's widow's pension from the Social Security Administration and an annuity from the Department of Defense Finance Accounting Service. The Department of Justice eventually grew suspicious of Zampak. When they questioned him, he attempted to convince investigators that his mother was still alive. Before his mother passed, Zampak had transferred her home to his name without her knowledge and used some of the money to pay off the mortgage on the San Diego house. Zampak also filed for bankruptcy, but didn't disclose that he owned the home. He also opened at least nine credit cards in his mother's name and racked up more than $28,000 in debt. Zampak claimed to be very remorseful during his trial, which seems like a good place to show remorse, and accepted full responsibility for what he did. U.S. Attorney Randy Grossman said that his fraud was one of the district's longest running and largest of its kind, so whether or not the remorse was real is up for debate. Zampak was found guilty of money laundering and social security fraud. He faced 20 years in prison and a $500,000 fine for money laundering and an additional five years in prison and a $250,000 fine for social security fraud. He also had to give back his mother's former property as restitution. The story would have been a lot more fun if he'd been dressing up like his mom too, in a sort of lighthearted psycho. Like a weekend at Bernie's thing. Think of the hijinks. Number four, the house always wins. Accountant Ben Carter defrauded clients out of millions of dollars to fund his gambling problem. Carter was the money man behind Australian beer brand Drink West, co-owned by rugby star Nathan Clary and UFC fighter Ty Tuvesa. Carter's Sydney-based firm, Carter's Tax Advisory, rose to prominence during the COVID-19 pandemic. During that time, it won multiple local business awards, starred in local newspaper ads, and developed a solid social media presence. The company had even partnered with well-known establishments and organizations like the rugby team Penrith Panthers. In late 2009, the firm released a promotion video of Carter shaking hands with one of the team's executives. Carter's tax advisory promised to provide players and staff with financial advice. But rather than make elaborate purchases or fund a lavish lifestyle, Carter just dumped all the money into gambling. Almost all the cash went into his sports bet account, but not even the stolen money was enough to fund his gambling. Carter also added some of his salary, business funds, dividends, and loans to keep gambling. So he had to figure out how to get more. So Carter told many of his clients that they owed money in their taxes when they didn't. He also made his victims believe they wouldn't receive tax refunds so he could steal them without anyone noticing. Australia's Tax Practitioners Board opened an investigation into Carter's tax advisory after receiving reports of alleged fraud. After searching Carter's home and business, investigators uncovered massive amounts of evidence against him, so much that Carter just ended up admitting to some of the allegations. Investigators seized hard drives, documents, electronic devices, and a small amount of, eh, let's just call it, nose beers. Court documents revealed that when Carter was chief financial officer for Drink West, he offered to buy $440,000 on behalf of an investor. But rather than invest it, Carter just kept the money. His girlfriend and office assistant, Amy Steele, attempted to help him cover his crimes, so she was arrested alongside Carter. A court had already convicted Carter of fraud in 2008, after he used his job as a bank teller to 
to steal $30,000. Carter had potential connections with organized crime associations, so the court refused his bail over fears that members would help him flee overseas. Sportsbet also allegedly incentivized Carter's behavior by offering to match dollar for dollar any proceeds that he gambled. Despite concerns over Carter's ability to legally fund his gambling problem, Sportsbet gave him corporate box tickets, flew him to gambling events, and paid for his accommodation. Carter sued the gambling organization for ignoring the concerning behaviors he was exhibiting when they reviewed him in 2021-2022. He was charged with 14 counts of dishonestly obtaining a financial advantage by deception, knowingly dealing with the proceeds of a crime and possessing a prohibited substance. Steele, his girlfriend, was charged with dealing with the proceeds of a crime. Did Sportsbet do anything wrong in this scenario? Is it their job to make sure people aren't gambling too much? Or do they have a responsibility to manage their platform simply because gambling problems can lead to criminal behavior? Number three, trust me, I'm a celebrity. Alicia Newby stole several people's identities, including Empire actress Terry G. P. Henson, and went on a modest spending spree. Newby hacked the Oscar and Emmy nominated actress's email account, which she then raided for personal information, like financial account data, phone numbers, and addresses. Newby made $12,000 in fraudulent transactions throughout her scam, although Henson's manager was able to recover $4,000. Newby also defrauded American Express, PayPal, JP Morgan Chase, and other companies companies in her scam, along with several other victims. Henson's manager noticed fraudulent charges on several of her accounts, which included online purchases with shipping addresses and names that the actress and her team didn't recognize. So, authorities conducted an almost year-long investigation before serving Newby a search warrant for her apartment. Investigators found items purchased in the scheme and seized several electronic devices. A few months before she was caught, a postal worker refused to deliver a package as she believed the shipping address had been used in an ID theft scam. Newby allegedly went after the worker, demanding she hand over the packages. She didn't want to get ripped off, you know. Police officers arrived at the scene, and their body cameras caught Newby's demands. She eventually received the packages after causing a scene at her local post office. Law enforcement lost track of Newby shortly after the incident when she moved out of her apartment, leaving thousands of dollars in damages and $4,000 in unpaid rent. Months later, she pawned a designer handbag using her actual ID, which was like a big giant spotlight for authorities. Newby was charged with one felony count of continuing a financial enterprise. They investigated Newby for a year over stealing $12,000 from a rich person who probably didn't even notice. Look, we're not saying what she did was okay, but that's barely out of small claims court, and the investigation probably cost twice that. If you're having any sort of legal issue, our advice is just to be rich. You'd be surprised how much it helps. Number two, Scam Canic. A New York auto repair business owner, Ibrahim Tony Issa, got rich by running a postal truck repair scam. The owner of First Star Auto Repair had offices in the Bronx and shops in Florida, Texas, and Michigan. Sounds like he's Mr. Worldwide. In exchange for access to work repairing and maintaining the organization's fleet of postal service vehicles, Issa bribed USPS vehicle managers with vacations, fancy dinners, and gifts. Issa's team worked on the USPS trucks and returned them with shoddy repairs or no repairs at all. He made $30 million in one year, having billed the USPS for work that was either unnecessary or incomplete. Which is such a cliche mechanic thing to do though, right? Way to propagate mechanic stereotypes, Tony. Additionally, Issa conspired with others to evade paying federal income taxes for his businesses by misreporting expenses and income to the IRS. He signed false personal tax income reports and failed to pay hundreds of thousands in taxes. The Office of the Inspector Inspector General received complaints about Issa's shoddy work, so a couple vehicle managers had to go undercover to get him. But Issa was unaware and treated the undercover agents like he did all his accomplices. He took them out to extravagant dinners and bought them fancy gifts. He appeared before a Manhattan federal court where he received 60 months in prison. Issa was also sentenced to three years of supervised release in order to pay the IRS $557,176 in restitution. What if they made a movie about the undercover guy? 
guy dealing with Issa. But it's treated like he's working with the mafia or something. Like, there could be a scene where the wife is crying because the guy is in too deep with Issa and it's like she doesn't even know him anymore as he slowly gets drawn to the seedy underworld of shoddy USPS truck repair. We're not saying we've already got a draft nearly complete or that it's something that would pretty much guarantee Michael Keaton, Amy Adams, and Tom Hardy the Oscars they should have had by now. Just saying. Number one, TSA means taking stuff again? Former TSA officer Piteous Brown stole over $800,000 of items from luggage and security checkpoints over four years. Brown worked at Newark Liberty International Airport and admitted that his job made it extremely easy for him to steal. Despite the TSA's zero tolerance policy for theft, the agency still fired almost 400 officers for stealing from passengers between 2003 and 2012. Although there were overhead surveillance cameras over the ticket counters to prevent thefts, they weren't always turned on. Brown typically worked alone and knew when the cameras weren't working. He also learned how to read x-ray scans to look for valuable items to steal, cameras, laptops, and other electronics. At the end of each shift, Brown would leave the checkpoint with the day's stolen goods and put them on eBay to sell. When he was arrested, Brown had 80 cameras for sale on his page, as well as video games and computers. After serving time for his four-year stealing spree, Brown went public with his operation and warned people that the TSA locks sold for luggage don't work. Apparently, TSA employees know how to pick them without detection. Really though, does anyone use those things thinking they're going to stop anyone that's not a toddler? Some guys like, click, now my stuff is secure. If that was you, we're sorry, but don't rely on those things. They look like what you get out of those quarter machines or something. Brown blamed his actions on how the agency treated him as an employee. The low pay and poor morale made it too tempting and easy to steal. In July of 2023, three other TSA officers were arrested. Elizabeth Fuster, Liberius Williams, and Joshua Gonzalez worked at Miami International Airport. Surveillance footage captured the trio attempting to distract passengers during screenings to steal items from their luggage. Gonzalez and Fuster confessed to repeatedly stealing from travelers, taking an average of $1,000 a day. Footage also caught Williams and Gonzalez taking $600 from a passenger's wallet during the screening process. Many believe the TSA's lack of training and minimal experience requirements were the reasons for the issues. While transportation security officers are one of the last layers of protection against someone taking weapons or explosives on a plane, the requirements for the position are minimal. Transportation security officers only need a high school diploma or one year's experience as an x-ray technician, security industry professional, or aviation screener. Once they pass their substance screenings, background checks, and medical evaluations, they're on the front lines, screening 2.2 million passengers every day nationwide. The TSA released a statement about its no-tolerance policy for workplace misconduct and that arrests such as those of Brown, Gonzalez, Fuster, and Williams were rare occurrences. It doesn't sound like the thefts are rare, though, does it? The agency also said that it performs screenings as required by the Aviation Security and Transportation Act. It recommended that flyers empty their pockets and place all valuables in carry-on bags. Why, so they don't have to look for your wallet? Whenever a company says they're doing the required this or that, it always comes off as really disingenuous though, doesn't it? Like they're screening employees because they have to, but they're put out about it. Brown said that there were so few anti-theft protocols in place that he left the checkpoint one day with a Nintendo Wii in hand. Public safety officials, however, have raised concerns about the fact that people who should be concentrating on traveler's safety are distracted by the prospect of stealing, which also feels really disingenuous. Oh, so you guys think that they should be doing their jobs instead of stealing? That's your big statement? Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather have. An amazing body with amazing health but average wealth or terrible body and terrible health but with 25 billion.